So as far as the potential components involved in thrombophilia, we've talked about some of the procoagulant ones and largely the factor V and the prothrombin are the ones that we concentrate on because they're the most prevalent and the most well-established. Regulatory ones, protein C, protein S, antithrombin are probably the most well-established. There's uh, less of a, uh, an association with many of the uh, fibrinolytic factors and true thrombotic um, risk. What I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about today are how to do the tests and some of the other, if you will, acquired or miscellaneous risk factors for thrombophilia. The largest probably are lupus anticoagulant and the other antiphospholipid antibodies like anticardiolipin antibodies or the anti-2-beta-2 uh, beta GP1 uh, assay antibodies as well. We'll, talk, we'll touch a little bit on, on homocysteine. But one point I'd like to make, since there's all of these different potential risk factors, is if you look at thrombophilic risk, if you have an individual who has a single hereditary risk factor, and then maybe they acquire another risk factor, say a lupus anticoagulant malignancy, uh, they become immobilized for a long period of time, their leg is in a caster and they're on a slow boat to China or a, a long airplane trip, um, maybe an acute precipitating risk factor, acute dehydration, acute infection, et cetera, uh, may be modulated by whether or not they're prophylaxed. Are they on any um, low molecular weight heparin or prophylaxis? All of this can go to add into the thrombotic risk. The hard thing with thrombosis, we talk about risk factors being you know, threefold, eightfold above normal. The hard thing with thrombophilic risk testing and that's largely what we do in the laboratory for thrombophilia testing, is we really can't say at this point, yes, this person may be at risk for thrombosis. We can't say that they're at risk for thrombosis tomorrow, next Tuesday, or at Christmas time. So we really can't predict when and if they will actually have thrombosis. But as far as risk factors, one of the things I want to emphasize that really th venous thrombosis and thrombophilia really is a disease of aging. As we all get older, we all become at higher risk for thrombosis. And if you look at uh, this data from several years ago, annual incidence of thrombosis per 100,000 people, uh, the black line is DVT, and this line here is DVT and pulmonary embolism. And you can see that the curve goes up with age. So what we're really talking about with the thrombophilic risk factors is that if you have an increased risk of thrombosis, at whatever age you are, if you have a threefold increased risk, say, of thrombosis, um, maybe you know at, at age 15 you have a one in 10,000 risk of having a, a thrombosis, and at age 70 or 80 you have a 60-fold increased risk of thrombosis just by aging. If, for example, you have a prothrombin mutation that gives you a threefold increased risk of thrombosis, at age 15, it might give you a thrombosis risk akin to someone who's 45 years old. For more thrombophilic mutations or scenarios, and one of the most thrombophilic is malignancy, that for a young individual with malignancy, they could have a thrombophilic risk akin to a 70-year-old. And in general, when we talk about malignancy, we don't usually do thrombophilia testing as far as these congenital risk factors in patients that have malignancy, because the malignancy itself is enough of a risk factor for thrombosis. Shouldn't matter whether they also have factor V Leiden or a lupus anticoagulant necessarily uh, modulating their thrombosis risk, because you would treat them um, for the thrombosis risk associated with the malignancy. So just before we go a little further, let's talk about some of the clinical correlates. I've been largely talking about the factors that lead into developing increased risk for venous uh, thromboembolism. And usually with venous thrombosis, we're talking about deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. And these are usually abnormalities of the coagulation proteins or the regulatory proteins. So increased coagulation either due to increased function or decreased regulators. Arterial thrombosis, and I won't really talk about this from here on out, but arterial thrombosis is largely we're talking stroke, myocardial infarction, arterial types of thrombotic uh, events. And these are typically increased uh, abnormalities of platelets, like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or some of the vascular wall abnormalities. Just looking back at some of the historical perspectives of this, the lupus anticoagulant had been kind of known for, for a while, but it wasn't really 
attached to or associated with a risk of thrombosis. I mean, initially, you know, if you look at lupus anticoagulants in your lab, they act like, you know, anticoagulants, right? So you would think that from a laboratory point of view, a high PTT and an inhibitor, that patient should be bleeding. And for years, that is really what was thought. And it wasn't until uh, Bowie in 1962 really tied it into a risk of, of thrombophilia. Antithrombin deficiency in about 1965. And then in the 1980s, we looked at and, and identified patients with congenital deficiencies of protein C and protein S. The factor V Leiden activated protein C story coming out of the Netherlands with Dahlbeck and Bertina, 93 and 94, and then Porton and their group looking at the prothrombin mutation in 1996. So what I'd like to do at this point is talk a little bit about some data that came out of a CAP a consensus conference on, on thrombophilic testing several years ago and talk a little bit about you know, some reasons to evaluate for thrombophilia and who are the appropriate people to actually look for thrombophilic mutations and, and thrombophilic abnormalities in. And really I think, if, I don't, how many of your labs do testing for thrombophilia? Are you seeing a lot of testing in general for thrombophilia? One of the things that I, I think you have to look at is really why docs are ordering the testing and in whom they're ordering the testing on. And I hope some of the cases highlight some maybe people not to do thrombophilia testing in. And essentially, I think one of the reasons to do the testing, because it's actually very expensive, uh, is that the result is going to influence either a current treatment decision in a patient or future management decisions. Um, and in general, most patients with venous thrombosis get put on heparin and then switch to warfarin. So immediate thrombophilia testing when somebody develops an acute DVT really shouldn't change the acute management decisions of patients. But long term, how long would they stay on warfarin therapy? If you identify just factor V Leiden, they might stay on uh, thrombo uh, anticoagulant therapy for somewhere between three and six months. Um, and they may not stay on, on anticoagulant therapy for life. However, if they have three or four abnormalities or if they've had a repeat thrombosis, then maybe they'd have lifelong warfarin therapy. The other reason to do testing might be to see whether it would influence the treatment management decisions uh, for the patient's family members. Or in, in, now patients are very savvy. They've done a lot of uh, reading and looking up on the internet and communicating information to the patient uh, regarding these predisposing factors. Some people will come in asking for factor V Leiden testing. So as I mentioned, a lot of the principles and, and some of the recommendations came out of the CAP consensus conference that was published. It was the whole uh, issue of Archives of Pathology and Lab Medicine published in uh, November 2002. And this came out of the CAP COEG Resource Committee. And John Olson uh, was the director um, of this uh, consensus conference. And in general, some of the what we did is invite about 30, 35 people. Wayne Chandler was um, at that too. And we kind of locked about 35 experts in a room for about three days. And we said, you're not going out until we come up with some of general recommendations. And we had a schedule, I think over three days, that had all of these different things we were going to discuss in order. And Factor V Leiden took us the entire first day. And it was supposed to take like an hour. And we sat there for a day arguing. And it actually was very good, because what we hashed out as far as some of the general principles for Factor V Leiden testing really kind of then replicated themselves for some of the other uh, thrombophilic parameters. And some of the things that we felt strongly about was don't test during the acute event. And that's a difficult one, because when you get a patient with venous thrombosis, you can't really test them the day before they develop the thrombosis, because they present once they've got the, the, the leg thrombosis. So in general, and as I mentioned too, your therapy is not going to change during the acute event. You go from heparin to, you know, to warfarin, so that's not going to really change. So perhaps the best time to do thrombophilia testing is after the patient's been treated uh, with warfarin. Um, and then maybe at that point, when they're in a more chronic state, you want to do the testing. You want to test in the appropriate clinical setting. And for, from a laboratory standpoint, use the functional assays. And we'll talk about those when appropriate. If you do identify an abnormality, you want to repeat that testing to document that abnormality prior to telling the patient, you know, Mrs. Jones, you're protein C deficient. <coughs> 